Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. A county in China's Inner Mongolia is under extended mandatory quarantine measures. Locals there may be facing a dire situation, with some saying they are running low on food. Though it seems Chinese authorities aren't too concerned. NTD's Don Ma has more. Amid mandatory quarantines and lockdowns in parts of China, residents report they're running low on food, and the authorities are doing little to help. That's the situation in an inner Mongolia county. The county, Yijin Banner, is currently labeled high risk for the virus, according to state-owned media CCTV. And many places there are under lockdown. A visitor to Yijin Banner tells the Epoch Times that he has been in a hotel under quarantine for more than 10 days, and it's getting harder and harder to get food. The newspaper gave him a pseudonym to protect his identity. Since the 21st, the government has been sending a free boxed meal a day. For the rest of the meals, we order takeout ourselves. But now there are fewer and fewer takeout vendors because those restaurants have fewer and fewer supplies. Mr. Wu says he has to pay for everything out of pocket, and no one has told him how much longer he will be quarantined. If this goes on, the situation may become more and more problematic because the restaurants can't buy supplies either. Supermarkets are not even open as of the 25th. A resident of Yijin Banner tells the Epoch Times that he also doesn't have enough food. After today, it will be 10 days since quarantine started. The government provided a meal and some instant noodles for free, as well as some ham and a face mask. It's definitely not enough, but what can you do? On the day of the interview, Beijing's National Health Commission reported that more than half of the total cases in China are from Inner Mongolia. Chinese authorities are amping up pandemic prevention and control measures to unprecedented levels. Now with the help of high-tech gear. They are now installing surveillance devices on doors and entrances to residents' homes that will alert authorities if anyone in the home so much as opens their door. Devices are being used to enforce lockdowns and quarantines in certain communities and districts. Chinese media reported that the director of one district in China's Gansu province called the devices extremely useful. With them installed, the moment a quarantine resident opens their door, the director will be alerted. Then all he has to do is make a phone call, and the resident can be dealt with. China has been practicing what it calls a zero-case policy. Even when only one confirmed case emerges in a given area, the whole neighborhood will be put under quarantine. Sometimes residents there will be made to stay home or go elsewhere in quarantine. In some extreme cases, that quarantine can last for months. Reports of the devices have caused a stir online. One netizen criticized the surveillance tactic, saying what authorities are doing equates to turning people's homes into prisons. Reports include Chinese authorities deploying these devices en masse. In one southern province, local media outlets say more than 17,000 of them have been installed. The CCP virus attacks North China again. Authorities confirmed positive COVID-19 cases in the northeastern province of Heilongjiang earlier this week. The hotspot city, Heihe, declared a lockdown immediately and started massive tests on its one and a half million people. Public transit and cab services are currently canceled. The city is now under lockdown. There is no exit nor entry to the city. That's the situation. All the shops are closed. When to open and when not to is up to the pandemic control office. Soon after, multiple cities in the same province escalated their control measures. And another outbreak that started with a tour group has now spread to half of all Chinese provinces, including Beijing, and it keeps expanding. For the first time during this outbreak, a community worker in Beijing has tested positive. And starting Thursday, the city began vaccinating children as young as three. A display of excessive virus prevention measures. Authorities in China's Hebei province locked down a multi-block shopping mall because a person there came into close contact with someone who had the virus elsewhere. They are not allowing anyone to leave. That's what a local says who narrowly escaped the lockdown. The local posted an online video right after her escape. She said it was so scary. She got out a mere minute before the lockdown started. She says all the entrances are sealed off and not even one person is allowed to come out. It is unknown if these people were released later or transported to quarantine centers.
Over the weekend in another city in the same province, a person tested positive for the CCP virus. As a result, about 2,000 people were sent to quarantine centers. 500,000 people had to be tested for the virus. This, according to Chinese state-run media. A series of military-related moves by China is raising concerns. It may indicate the communist regime is shifting towards wartime policy. On Tuesday, communist leader Xi Jinping called for efforts to, quote, break new ground, both in military equipment and weapons development for the Chinese army. The past Sunday, the regime's National People's Congress issued a decision to temporarily suspend a number of national defense laws. The notice said Chinese military actions will now follow direct orders from the Communist Party. Those defense laws will be adjusted later. Many Chinese netizens believe the law suggests the regime is getting ready to invade Taiwan. Some left comments like, we have to liberate Taiwan, and something huge is coming on social media platform Weibo. China also announced it will provide free medical services for the spouses of military members. That plus discounted services for their parents. The news again prompted online discussion on whether the regime is preparing to take action against Taiwan. China also passed a new land border law last week. In it, Beijing declared it will combat any act that undermines territorial sovereignty and land boundaries. That drew sharp reaction from India. India's foreign ministry spokesman said China's new law could have implications for conditions in border areas. That says tensions between the two countries are still on the rise after last year's deadly standoff at their shared border. No one knows whether or when the Chinese regime will be ready to start a war. Many believe military conflict may also be too costly for China right now. But there is one thing to take note of about the current leader Xi Jinping. According to China expert and former professor at Peking University, Dr. Christopher Balding. If we look at even domestically how he's, you know, remaking the party and dealing with political enemies, I would call him he is not risk averse as a leader. He is very willing to smash things that uh, he thinks are no longer useful or serve his objectives. And so I think we need to get rid of this idea that the cost would be too high, the risk is too much. Balding says one doesn't need to look very far to see it. I see little evidence that she and China under she is not willing to take those risks. I think they're very willing to take those risks. I think they're very willing to take the, to bear those initial costs. I think there, there might be some uh, potential caveats, like if you start incurring large amounts of deaths, for instance, trying to invade Taiwan, Balding called the South China Sea and Hong Kong two good examples of this. The U.S. is reiterating its commitment to Taiwan. Washington's top diplomat in Taipei says the U.S. is committed to bolstering Taiwan's ability to defend itself. This after President Biden said earlier this week that the U.S.'s commitment to Taiwan is rock solid. Sandra Odekirk, who heads the de facto U.S. Embassy in Taiwan, made her comment today in the first news briefing since she took up her post in July. The United States has a commitment to help Taiwan provide for its self-defense. Um, and that's part of the Taiwan Relations Act. It's a commitment we take very seriously. Our commitment to Taiwan is rock solid and contributes to the maintenance of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait and within the region. Sandra Odekirk's remarks came after Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen told CNN that a small team of U.S. soldiers are stationed on the democratically ruled island to provide support and training to local troops. When asked for more details on the presence of U.S. forces, Odekirk declined to comment on specific operations or training. Chinese Communist Party leader Xi Jinping will participate in the Group of 20 Leader Summit in Rome this weekend. According to a notice from China's Foreign Ministry on Friday, he'll join via video link. Here's more. With two high-stakes climate talks scheduled for the weekend, all eyes were on China after President Xi Jinping said Friday he would not be attending either the G20 summit or the UN's COP26 in person. Beijing, however, said that he would be making a speech via video link in front of the G20. Leaders of the world's 20 richest economies are expected to meet this weekend in Rome, their first face-to-face -face meeting in two years. A draft communique seen by Reuters showed they'll be announcing plans to ramp up efforts to curb global warming. The G20 accounts for 80% of the world's carbon emissions, with China easily at the top of that list. 
That means world climate goals largely depend on its actions in the near future. GE Appliances plans to add more than 1,000 jobs as its Kentucky operations. It's part of a $450 million investment to expand capacity and launch new products. It didn't offer specifics about its new product plants. The company expects to add the new jobs by the end of 2023. It says most will be assembly line jobs, along with some management and operation support positions. Its CEO says the company continues to bring manufacturing back to the United States. And this is related to China in some sense, because this company is now owned by a Chinese firm. Originally, it was owned by General Electric, one of the biggest companies in the U.S. But five years ago, Chinese firm Hire purchased GE appliances for more than $5 billion. Coming up, it seems a given that media outlets work to report the facts, but some of them in China may not be following that rule. State-run news outlets in the country may not always be showing the big picture, while accusations blame them for getting creative in their reports. Incidents range from what look like pre-planned random interviews to arranging sets and using props. In this special report, we look at cases where Beijing's picture-perfect news coverage may have slipped up, revealing a behind-the-scenes look at what some call fabricated news coverage. Media outlets around the world operate under one purpose, to spread information. Most seek to educate, entertain and inform their audiences about what's happening. That task may seem straightforward, to provide factual, up-to-date details free of bias. But there's another goal on the table for a handful of those outlets, to convince or influence their viewers in a certain direction. In this special report, we zero in on what's now described as fake news, a term that's been making U.S. headlines for months. But in some places, actually runs much deeper than many may realize. In China, a number of major media outlets are vocal about what they call a zero-tolerance policy for supposed fake news. One of them is the Global Times, a state-run tabloid that operates under the country's largest newspaper group, People's Daily. Known for its pro-China nationalism, the outlet has been quick to denounce other media and even other countries for spreading alleged fake news. But an annual report from Reporters Without Borders may contradict its zero-tolerance claim and similar statements from other state-backed Chinese news sources. The World Press Freedom Index measures the level of freedom journalists enjoy in different countries. This year, it ranked China nearly dead last, coming in at 177 out of 180 countries globally. Let's look at a video that seems to suggest some major questions about the coverage put out by Chinese media. This clip captures a reporter from the Chinese regime's central broadcaster CCTV doing a street interview. Take a look. In it, the CCTV reporter was covering the local situation after an earthquake in China's Sichuan province. At first glance, she seems to pick out a random person from a line of people to interview. But taking a closer look, the boy she interviewed appears to have been pre-selected. He's first seen standing in line. As the reporter nears him, she hadn't finished talking yet, so she passes him and continues down the line of people. The boy takes notice, seemingly realizing he was too far ahead and in the wrong position in line. He's then seen leaving his place in line to one further back. But again, he miscalculates. The reporter reaches him again, but is still not done speaking. She keeps walking, and he again moves further back in line. When she finally stops, she appears to pick him out of the crowd to interview. If the interview was in fact predetermined, it begs the question, was his response prearranged too? In communist China, the apparent staging of news coverage is believed to be commonplace, especially when it comes to news reports about high-level Chinese Communist Party officials traveling to towns or cities outside Beijing. Whenever a top official pays local residents a visit, the coverage appears to follow a pattern. First, the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP official, arrives in a given city or county, often in a relatively good-looking area. Then he asks locals about how they're doing or their quality of life. They respond, without exception, by explaining that everything is great. The official then replies that they are very glad the locals are doing well. 
That's generally how things work with these kind of visits. That is, if everything goes according to plan. But as expected, there have been times when they haven't. And some of them have been caught on tape. One instance happened last March amid pandemic-driven lockdowns in Wuhan City. That's when Chinese Communist Party Vice Premier Sun Chunlan conducted a supposed inspection of a local district there. The purpose of her visit was to check on residents. But according to some, the endeavor was merely posture. As the Vice Premier walked through the district, some locals could be heard collectively shouting from their windows. It's fake. Everything's fake. At the time, one resident told NTD that everything officials saw during their inspection had been cherry-picked. While a netizen wrote on social media that to keep up appearances, officials reportedly chose people to act as volunteers, pretending to deliver food to residents amid the lockdown. The netizen added that the vice premier had to cut her inspection short and leave the district because of the commotion residents were making. Of course, it's not just the CCP's vice premier making these trips. Both CCP head Xi Jinping and Premier Li Keqiang have taken part in what have been called orchestrated local visits. And some of them had had apparent blunders, too. Let's take a look at another example from 2020. In March last year, Xi Jinping paid a visit to Wuhan amid the lockdowns. He traveled there shortly after the vice premier's visit. The trip marked Xi's first outing to a local city since the outbreak began. Chinese state-run media reported that the visit was to express his regards to frontline workers, community staff and residents. Media coverage of the occasion shows him receiving plenty of fanfare. At one point, the camera pans to residents inside their buildings, shouting greetings towards Xi Jinping from their windows. But was this enthusiastic welcome genuine? Looking at social media posts from that time, many locals shared that they were actually blocked from watching the official visit. One social media post explained that in their building, police had come to monitor every residential unit, guarding people's balconies to prevent them from approaching or shouting during Xi's visit. Another post described that police are already sitting on my balcony, stopping us from watching. Other posts describe similar situations. One netizen wrote that two police officers had been sent to their co-workers' home to keep an eye on them. There, the officers supposedly instructed them to shout spirited greetings towards Xi Jinping, but threatened to arrest them if they yelled anything else. One clip also captured a group of locals while in the middle of shouting out greetings to Xi. It too seems to suggest authorities gave them instructions for their participation. The video shows two locals waiting inside their home for Xi Jinping to step off his bus. As Xi came out, the two of them can be heard repeatedly asking someone, can we shout now? The examples don't stop there. Besides authorities' visits, a number of other seemingly staged media campaigns have circulated throughout the country. In this video, we see authorities filming footage of Chinese police sweeping litter off the street. On the surface, the clip looks to show how hardworking the officials are and their efforts to improve the area. But the situation may not really be what it seems. At the beginning of the video, one person can be seen throwing a piece of garbage she's holding onto the ground. If she were really sweeping litter off the street, wouldn't tossing it back be counterproductive? Other footage captures similar effects. Here, authorities are filming public servants as they sweep flood or rainwater out of the street. Again, it seems to document the caring nature of Chinese authorities. But where exactly is the rainwater coming from? A nearby fire hose. There's more. In this video, a reporter is filming Chinese police as they supposedly help push a broken-down van through a flooded street. But here's the twist. The van is actually fully functional. Let's take a look at the video from the beginning. In the full version of the clip, an officer is seen standing beside the reporter before pulling over the otherwise working vehicle. He arranges the scene, calling over two yellow-vested officers. And when the camera starts rolling, they push it for the reporter to film. 
And in another video, an officer is seen just having finished pushing a person in a wheelchair across an intersection. The twist? The seemingly wheelchair-bound person can stand on his own. That's not the only photo called into question either. But in other cases, the truth is seemingly revealed not through behind-the-scenes clips, but by photo editing mishaps. In a number of incidents, apparently doctored photos, widely described as disastrous and rather amusing, have been shared online. At first touted by CCP officials as genuine, many are later taken down after they fail to pass public scrutiny. For example, this photo. UK-based media The Guardian said it may well be one of the worst doctored photographs in Internet history. So what's the story behind it? At the time, a new road had recently been built in a county inside China's Sichuan province. The image was supposed to show a trio of officials inspecting the newly constructed street. Despite the clear doctoring, the photo went up on the county's official government website. But Chinese netizens weren't fooled. Calls started flowing into the county's public relations office, while parodies appeared online commenting on the fact that the men in the picture seem to be floating above the ground. As for the claim made by tabloid newspaper The Global Times, its so-called zero-tolerance policy for fake news may not really hold up, and the same seems to apply in many areas of Chinese state media coverage. So why go through all the trouble? The situation is widely believed to boil down to one thing, reputation. Staged news coverage, selected videos and doctored photos could grant the Chinese regime a tighter grip on its public image and allow it to make sure that image remains a favorable one. And that's all for today's China in Focus. Thanks for watching and see you next time.